uh, thank you very much first for this invitation. You know, it's very kind to you. I appreciate this opportunity to ex exchange uh, some information with this uh, group in Russia because you have a long history on this, uh, in this science and it's always, it is always worth to discuss together. In France, uh, we are a small association dealing with this subject, but in France, you know, this is a rather small country, at least on this matter. And we organize a conference every two years, basically. We had the first one in 2016 in Avignon, a second one in Paris in 2018. And uh, the last one was in uh, last November via, of course, uh, WebEx virtual conference because of this uh, COVID problem. During this last conference, we had uh, 11 presentations in total. Some of them, I don't need to present them because these are dealing with uh, general reviews, you know, of this uh, LENR cold fusion subject. And I noticed in past conference, in uh, looking at your past conference, that you do it very well as well, if not better. So no need to discuss this, uh, what we presented in Paris. And uh, we could discuss as much as you want later about these uh, European projects. And also maybe more interesting uh, experimental results. And these are mainly the three presentations I decided to present this afternoon. With some more dealing with theories, you know, but uh, this is highly specialized and I don't, I would not be able myself, I am not a theorist, theorist to present a presentation on theories. Anyway. So first, this uh, European project, Clean HME, it stands for Clean Hydrogen Metal Energy. Last year, two years ago now, the European Commission launch a call for proposal for breakthrough energy technologies. And including in these uh, potential technologies, it was mentioned, you know, metal hydrogen energy. So we decided to, two projects decided to submit an offer and uh, two projects, uh, several projects decided to propose something and two projects have been uh, financed. So the first one, this is Clean HME. It gathers uh, 16 partners with uh, the leader from uh, Czechin University in Poland, but also uh, Marine University in Poland. The CNRS, uh, this is the French Cent National uh, Research Center in France, Polytechnico de Torino, and, and so forth, including an uh, university in Canada. This is not uh, in Europe, but still, uh, these Canadians were allowed to join this, uh, this project. And also, six companies, South von Rohr, this this is an equipment supplier in France, Vegatech, specialized company, a company specialized in uh, fluid, uh, let's say control equipment, and also uh, some others, you know, with a budget of 5.5 million euros. And this, the objective of this Clean HME project are very ambitious. This is to develop a new source of energy based on hydrogen metal energy, but also, also something very important to develop a theory to explain this phenomena. Indeed, the project leader, this is uh, who is Konrad Czerski in Czechin, in Poland, 
has some ideas regarding these theories, especially based on the screening potential of uh, metal lattices for proton and deuterons, which may enhance in, by many orders of magnitude these uh, the probability of uh, fusion between these light atoms. And this is investigated by accelerators driven at very low energies. There is one such accelerator in Chechen, and we, they are using it. There are others also in, uh, in Germany. Uh, they want also to replicate the results already published on nanopowders with gas loading experiments and uh, to go further to develop other active materials. So this is a four years project and uh, nine months already elapsed now since the beginning that they are still striving, striving to develop a theory and new active uh, materials. This is not an easy task, eh? for sure. The second project, this is Hermes, gathering uh, only universities and research centers with a leader in uh, Pedja Pelko in Turk, at Turku University, this is in Finland, but uh, gathering also the workforces of uh, uh, Technische Universiteit München. CNRS, another laboratory from the CNRS again in France, Andro University in Czechia, the Imperial College in the UK. This is quite surprising because of the Brexit, you know, uh, the United Kingdom is no longer part of the European Commission, but still they are involved in this project and Limerick University in Ireland and Alto University in Finland with a budget of 4 million euros. And the objectives, this is to study in experiment and on computer models, the influence of uh, uh, isotopes, isotopic effects in hydrogen node materials. Indeed, these people, there are specialists in, you know, in batteries, uh, hydrogen metal, uh, hydrate batteries, uh, hydrides to store hydrogen in a solid form. And they are mainly interested to, to join this project to gather more, let's say, understanding of the isotopic effect on these uh, materials used for batteries and hydrogen storage. Indeed, they are going to, you, to restart everything from uh, scratch with uh, uh, electrolysis, electrochemical uh, experiments, both at room temperature and at high temperature. But also they want to focus on uh, reproducibility of these uh, results. And indeed, they don't worry very much if they don't succeed in making cold fusion, because for them, the best, the, the, uh, the, larger, the largest interest for them is to obtain more information on the other top effects for hydrogen, you know, storage in batteries and things like that. They are even able to make, uh, as we call them, the ab initio studies, ab initio calculations. This is, uh, it means using computers to simulate just on computers, atoms and electrons and everything, you know, going around to see what happens in such and such cases. This is Imperial College is the capability to use these very large computer models. This is the Hermes project. So 
we had other presentations in this uh, conference, and one of the most intriguing, intriguing one was this uh, presentation made by Frank Gordon in Harper White House uh, from, uh, from California, actually. And the, the title was a Lattice Energy Convert. It was presented in French uh, by Jean-Paul Biberian, indeed. And what did these people do? This is quite uh, interesting because uh, uh, they made a discovery a few years ago. They wanted to see if it would be possible to ionize the gas using americium-241. And uh, because indeed in the past, from Gordon and the colleagues were specialists in atomic or in radioactive batteries, you know, this kind of uh, very small batteries using radioisotopes to produce small quantity of electricity, but as, at a very high voltage. So they were uh, looking at this, but uh, they used this with hydrogen and palladium. And uh, they realized that they were uh, getting much more current, several orders of magnitude more than expected from these, uh, I would say, conventional radioactive batteries. And uh, the current conducting uh, was using this uh, americium 241, but uh, but the sensitivity of the instrumentation was not enough to make a clear distinction of the current obtained. So they realized that uh, this current was not coming indeed from the americium, radioactive americium, but uh, from something else. And probably the palladium hydride itself is ionizing the gas, the hydrogen. Very surprising. So they made a very simple uh, experiment like this, experimental like this, with uh, two tubes, two concentric tubes. You are going to see a sketch uh, of the internals uh, later. But uh, with internal tube um, covered with uh, palladium and uh, an external tube, ion tube around. And between this tube, uh, some gas, you know, hydrogen or deuterium, and just one electrode connected to the internal tube, another electrode connected to the external tube, between to in order to to manage to maintain the gap between these two concentric tubes, you know, number seven, you have uh, O rings, so just rubber uh, uh, rubber rubber rings to maintain the distance. And thanks to that, they are able to measure a current, a spontaneous current between these two. So it's very surprising. You have two tubes. The inner one is covered with palladium. The external one is just a bare uh, steel, if I remember. You put hydrogen or deuterium in these uh, in this tube assembly, and you get some current. And they were able to measure this current with a very simple, you know, voltmeter like that, with a 10 mega ohm input uh, impedance. In order to get a better assessment of this current, they decided to load this uh, cell on resistors, you know, adding uh, 10 kilo ohms uh, each time in parallel to see what was happening. And you see indeed that uh, if, you increase, if you decrease the resistance, of course, 
you increase the current, but you decrease the open cell, the, the cell voltage. You exhaust indeed this uh, very small generator. With 10 kilo ohms, you have a very small voltage. So this is uh, not a very powerful generator, but still the fact that it generates current spontaneously, it's quite surprising. They observed something else. They decided to heat up a little bit these uh, tubes. And you see that the temperature was going from 295 Kelvin, 20 degrees uh, Celsius, sorry, to 340, uh, 70 degrees uh, Celsius. And you see that this voltage went up from uh, 8 millivolt up to 200, 300, 400 millivolts. Quite interesting. The fact is that this voltage is not stable. You get spikes and bursts and variations and fluctuations all the time. So uh, this is not a very smooth and stable electric, electrical uh, generation, generation of electricity. In order to have a better look at this phenomenon, they decided to set up a different experimental system like this. You have in the center this palladium uh, electrode. This is a tube covered with palladium on the outside surface. The outside uh, tube now is much larger. And between these two tubes in this gas space, you put an assembly of uh, foils, of fins, alternating between zinc and copper. Zinc, copper, zinc, copper, zinc, copper, zinc, copper. You connect all these uh, zinc electrodes together, all the copper electrodes together, and you measure now the voltage between the zinc electrodes and the copper electrodes. And by the way, you also monitor the voltage between these uh, palladium central tube and these copper electrodes, you know. And as a gas, you use uh, hydrogen or deuterium. And hydrogen or deuterium at atmospheric pressure, you know, just atmospheric pressure. No need for vacuum or pressurizing. And this is what they get. Uh, The temperature, they, they change the temperature along this experiment. But between uh, the zinc fins and the copper fins, they got uh, connected to a 10 mega ohm again uh, voltmeter. They got uh, 0 0.2 volts, 200 millivolts. While between this copper and the central palladium covered tube, we've Oh, this is a five mega ohm uh, voltmeter. They got a negative voltage. Jean-Paul Biberian, you know Jean-Paul Biberian. This is a Frenchman. He is the guy who made this presentation on behalf of Frank Gordon during this uh, seminar for the French society. But uh, he was aware of this uh, experimental work and he decided to replicate it. Exactly the same thing with a central tube of palladium inserted into a stainless steel tube. All that with hydrogen, light hydrogen, not deuterium. And he got something between 300 millivolts and 500 millivolts again. So this is not a purely American phenomenon. You can, we could replicate it as well in France.
during the same uh, conference, someone else, maybe you know him, Fabrice David, uh, made very similar, indeed, uh, reported very similar experiments, again, with spontaneous uh, generation of electricity. So it was very, it was really a chance to have these two presentations in the same day. And this is in French, but it means a replication of a direct conversion, you know. Fabrice David worked with, uh, in collaboration with American partners in Florida during several years, and they developed what they call these uh, fusion diode. What is a fusion diode? This is again, uh, uh, an aluminum tube insulated internally by uh, indeed a PVC uh, plastic tube. And inside you put progressively, uh, you fill up with powder, but the powder composition changes from between uh, just uh, palladium at, at the bottom and pure silicon at the top. So you have here, you have a lot of palladium, very little uh, quantity of silicon. And uh, here you have 50-50 palladium silicon. And here, mostly only silicon and no palladium anymore. And with some valve to fill up with uh, hydrogen or deuterium. In, them. in their case, this was mainly deuterium. And this is what they see, you know. Uh, the time here is in minutes. So this is one day, two days, and things like that. And the fact is on my screen, ah, okay, uh, that's fine, sorry. Uh, you see the voltage obtained in argon, almost nothing. In hydrogen, light hydrogen, during these uh, two days, uh, a fluctuating voltage going up to 300, uh, 350 millivolts. And with deuterium, this is the yellow curve. I don't know if you see it, but uh, something spiking up to 500 millivolts going back again along the time. This is not stable and to 400 millivolts. With the same observation, you get a spontaneous voltage. It's not stable. It is clearly related to the interaction between palladium and hydrogen or deuterium. You get nothing in uh, inert gas. So it's quite strange. But this is a monitoring during the first two days. But indeed, they kept these devices working during several months, uh, as much as 11 months, if I remember what Fabrice David uh, told us. And during all this time, these systems were was producing uh, a little bit of electricity. Not much, indeed. Huh? I don't know if you know Fabrice David. This is this man, a very nice shop. Here is in Florida, this lab filling up this tube with an hydraulic press, you know, <laughs> making this very interesting experiment. Unfortunately, uh, with no money to do this, so during some months, he was able to do these experiments together with this uh, American company in Florida. But later on, uh, the project uh, was finished. And now, I guess he's not working anymore on this subject, except that he's still on his own making some experiments he reported in the same conference, developing, for example, what we could call these gas cells. What are these gas cells? This is, uh, these are, they are made with uh, glass, uh, small gas. Uh, Cup. Inside, you 
sorry, inside you put uh, some electrodes, not uh, a copper grid here, indeed here a copper grid, and here an electrode made of copper with some pallium coated by electrolysis, you know, electrochemical deposition. Here you have a tube, glass tube, to fill up, to make a vacuum or to fill up with hydrogen or deuterium. And these two electrodes, you can connect to a voltmeter to check what is happening. And in hydrogen, they got 50, he, got, uh, he gets uh, 50 millivolts, you know, again, of spontaneous voltage. And again, this is at uh, normal pressure. So what is the explanation for that? This is a figure adapted from what uh, Fabrice uh, David told us. In his view, you know, we see that some electrons go from the palladium to the copper electrode. And it means that uh, if the electrons go like this, you have positive ions, you know, going the other way, obviously across the gas space. So you have some uh, atomic or hydrogen ions uh, in one form or the other traveling from this palladium to the copper. And maybe one possible explanation is that any LENR phenomenon here on this palladium helps to eject uh, this, here is he, he wrote uh, H2 plus, H2 plus uh, molecules, why not? Which are traveling all the way down to this copper electrode. And they recover here this uh, electron and it maintains the voltage between these two. This is a tentative explanation, you know, but indeed it should deserve much more investigation. That's all for this, uh, let's say, spontaneous electric, spontaneous generation of electricity in these gas uh, cells uh, with different electrodes, a very strange phenomenon. That's not, that's not all. In this uh, same day, we had a novel presentation by the Institut Louis de Broglie. I know, maybe you know this name, Louis de Broglie, huh? is the guy who uh, uh, wrote for the first time the relationship between uh, uh, particles movement and uh, wavelengths. And they made quite interesting studies presented by Gaetan de la Chaise Murel. Gaetan de la Chaise Murel, who is working at CEI, uh, Commissariat Energy Atomic, in Arpajon. Indeed, he is employed by the CEA, but it does not mean that the CEA has any responsibility in the, in the in, uh, experiment I'm going to present in a few minutes. Uh, he is just allowed to work on his own at times on this subject. Okay, don't believe the CEA is deeply involved in that. This is not the case. So this group, indeed, they are looking for uh, magnetic monopoles. Another French theorist, Georges Lecoq, who died one month ago, proposed in 1984 an equation to describe the a lepton, what he called a lepton monopole, a very light monopole. Leonid Rutskoev, this guy you know, made experiments with electrical discharge in water and to detect a particle which could be a lepton monopole. So this institute, Louis de Broglie and uh, this man from Sierra, collaborated with Ecole Centrale de Nantes in France. This is a large, this is a, 
yes, a large engineering school, uh, to study again discharges in water, quite similar to what Yurutsko uh, have made some years ago. So this is an experimental setup in Nantes at this school. You see here uh, a container where these uh, electrical discharges are made. They collect the gas coming out after the explosion. They measure also the voltage during the discharge. And what are they doing? They are using indeed very much, very like, uh, very similar to what Rutsko did, a titanium piece with a three millimeter of conductor size in the middle with larger piece for electrical connection. This titanium wire was placed in this container covered with uh, polyethylene, uh, you know, plastic bag for electrical uh, insulation. The water, after the explosion, the water was collected, the oxide falling to the bottom were also collected, but the gas also coming, uh, uh, generated by the explosion was also collected for analysis. And for this discharge, they have a capacitor bank of 400 microfarads, they can load up to 7,000 volts. Uh, okay, with a switch here. And this is the kind of electrical discharge they get. Uh, the current here up to 40,000 amps. The voltage, in this case, 3,000 volts. And even uh, the ground connection uh, during the discharge, the ground connection is not at zero volt, you know, because of this very large current, you have to take uh, into account the fact that this uh, uh, ground connection is above indeed the zero volt level. Energy in this case, uh, 2,220 uh, joules within uh, 80 microseconds, you know, quite a large instantaneous power. They made several experiments like that, and they had the chance at CR to have this uh, water, the water coming out of this container. Uh, analyzed to see the quantity of deuterium in this water. And maybe, you know, in, on, the, on the earth, you can have in natural waters, uh, you know, in the ocean, in lakes, in uh, ground water, in different places, you know, in desert areas, different kinds of waters, which are enriched more or less in deuterium because the evaporation, you know. But the fact is, when you, are, when you have an enrichment in deuterium, you also detect everywhere on planet Earth uh, an enrichment in oxygen-18. So the re ratio oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 is strongly related everywhere on Earth to this ratio deuterium to hydrogen. And uh, everything you do should fall on this red curve. But in fact, at times, you get much more deuterium than normal. Even if you got uh, some oxygen 18, you had uh, too much deuterium. And at times, you had too little deuterium and too much oxygenating. So it means that indeed uh, nuclear reactions were taking place in during these uh, electrical discharges. Quite interesting. 
they made also did other experiments in an attempt to evaluate if there was some energy produced. So this one shot electrical discharge to destroy uh, titanium wire is not easy to assess if there is a production of energy. So they made a different setup, much smaller in a glass container like this with uh, an electrode uh, dipping into this water, normal water, and with discharges of 300, 350 microfarad uh, capacitor bank, charge up to a few kilovolts, I don't remember, and with some uh, uh, sodium hydroxide in this water to help uh, the electrical conduction. So they have nice uh, electrical equipment to measure very rapidly and very uh, high rate the voltage between these electrodes as well as the current flowing through these electrodes. And the, volt the, the discharges are indeed switched on and off via this uh, MOSFET IGBT uh, semiconductor. And they make these experiments like the following way. It's quite interesting. Please follow. The water is heated up by uh, a heater at the bottom, you know, up to 100 degrees C. The container is well insulated, but it is put up to 100 degrees C, so the water evaporates, you know, slowly but surely. And you see here the quantity of uh, water in grams. So this water goes down because the water evaporates slowly. And during some minutes, you know, they make many discharges. Uh, maybe hundred to several hundreds of uh, discharges in this uh, small container. And indeed, they say, should the, they see that the water evaporates much faster during these discharges than before and after the discharges, during the wait, waiting time before and after. And should the electrical energy injected in this water by the discharges, it's easy to know what is the electrical energy input, isn't it? The water should go down that way because of this additional energy input. But indeed, we get much more. And uh, we made sure also that there was no uh, water droplets sent in the air, you know, in these, uh, during these discharges because uh, the, the electrodes are dipping quite uh, well in this uh, cell. The cell itself is covered uh, in order to avoid any water loss by, uh, by these small explosions. We see some steam coming out, but we know that the steam is dry just by looking at uh, the transparency of the steam stream coming out. So, frankly speaking, there is very little chance there is water lost by uh, spitting out uh, water droplets. And in spite of that, we see that uh, the energy output is 1.9 times larger than this electrical input. I hope you followed me because it's quite uh, tricky. Indeed, I have to admit something. I love this kind of experiment. And in the next pictures, I am going to show some other experiments I made myself with uh, water discharges some years ago. 
we saw this as, these are not things I presented during this conference on last November, but things I presented before. But as these uh, are strongly related to what uh, Gaetan Lachaise Murel uh, and uh, Institut Louis de Bruyne uh, demonstrated, I could not resist this afternoon to show you uh, also what I did a few years ago. This uh, experimental setup works like this. I have a five kilovolt uh, DC supply. And this electrode is uh, operated mechanically by a system that alternately connects this electrode to a zero point uh, microfarad capacitor and at times connect this to the water to discharge this capacitor via this uh, water. Uh, you see that I could uh, monitor the voltage here uh, and also the current here, but uh, you are not going to see these electrical measurements because uh, looking at them, Together with the friends from Institut Louis de Broglie, we came to the conclusion that my instrumentation for uh, electrical measurement uh, is not adequate. This piece of equipment nowadays is in the uh, is in the hands of this institute, Louis de Broglie. So they are supposed to make further experiments with it with their very nice electrical uh, instrumentation. But unfortunately, because of the COVID problem, you know, nothing is happening for the moment. But I hope we are going to renew this kind of experiments in the near future. So this is a next, these are two examples of what you see when you make such electrical discharge in the water. This is the moving electrode, you know, in two different uh, uh, discharges. Sometimes a discharge is like that. You just discharge a capacitor with a small arc above this water. And you see uh, a nice arc, a nice spark and nothing more. Sometimes it's quite different and you get a very violent explosion. And I am going to show you some examples in a few minutes. But uh, at times you get this, sometimes you get that. And it is also a problem in this case because uh, they know that when they make many, many discharge uh, by uh, triggering this uh, MOSFET, at times, they don't get all. They don't always get the same kind of explosion. This is the same problem. So, this is what I did. For example, you see here uh, an explosion, a small one, a small one, an explosion, a miss, a miss. Here again, an explosion. An explosion, a small explosion, a mist, an explosion, an explosion again, different electrodes, you know. When you have an explosion, the water is thrown in the air. I'm going to show you a small spark, a small spark, a small spark. Here, an explosion. Here, a small spark, and so forth. An explosion again. Here, an explosion. And here, a strong explosion. You see, when you have like some explosions, they might be very strong. And uh, we can compare what is happening in these different cases, you know, uh, because. You have seen, uh, I made some uh, movies of these uh, experiments, and we can compare frame by frame what is happening between a, a gentle spark 
and a water arc explosion. This is at the moment of this uh, explosion. In this case, you see the spark uh, on the ca very calm uh, water. The counter electrode, by the way, is uh, just a needle. Huh? And here you don't see anything because, uh, you know, there is uh, a very bright uh, light thunder. So at this moment, this is the situation. And 60, 33 milliseconds later, most of the water is thrown in the air, you know. And you get a storm in this bottle when you have an explosion. Why? In the other case, nothing is happening, absolutely nothing. And it takes some time before the water uh, settles again at the bottom. The electrodes now is moving up again. And that's all. So thank you for listening. Okay, Jacques, thank you very much for your presentation. You, you took approximately 50 minutes, it's okay. And I ask uh, everybody, I ask everyone to ask questions. Для этого надо вот, поднимать ладонь. Ну, вот, там, uh, Jack, I explained for our Russian colleagues how, yeah, to, yes, please, please do, please do, please do. how to put questions to, to you. Да? Вот. We, we, we have one uh, question now. And uh, и, и я, я остальных прошу также. Вот, uh, надо нажать на участники, клавишу участники. Там справа будет, uh, развернется полотенце, на котором... Можно будет нажать клавишу э, поднять руку. Значит, ну вот у нас есть, у нас есть значит, первый вопрос. Это, э, это про, про Свирнов. Александр Просвирнов хочет задать вопрос. Александр, пожалуйста, плиз. Жак, one common question. Yes. What's, what's your opinion and the opinion of your French colleagues? Is it the uh, effect of Andre Rossi uh, is a real device or it is fake? Uh, what device? Yekat. Yekat. Uh, Yekat of Andre Rossi. Do you know Andre Rossi? Ah, Rossi. Andre Rossi. Rossi. Yes. Oh, this is an old story. We yes. don't have. Uh, we don't. Ten years. Have, uh, yes. We don't have many news from uh, Rossi these days. Yeah? For me, I have quite, uh, there is no official opinion from our organization, but at least I have my own views on that. Maybe Rossi really had something in hand when he was working together with uh, uh, his uh, Italian counterpart. Okay. Yes, and based on that, he tried to make things uh, larger and larger. And indeed, uh, he went too fast. He could not control what was happening. And apparently, indeed, I guess uh, he's not able to reproduce what he did, uh, what he, he says he can do. It is also very strange to see that he switch from a so-called one megawatt uh, power unit based on this ECAT, uh, the original ECAT, to other things with the OTCAT and now the XCAT. This man is running uh, ahead and uh, it's, it's quite strange. Okay, quite strange. Yes. No, no, no problem. It's, uh, this question uh, isn't concerned to the uh, to the uh, theme of our webinar now. It's your report, and maybe somebody else would like to ask something concerning. But, uh, 
as you are asking me, what is of interest these days? I don't know if you are aware of what is being done in Japan these days. I don't what know do about Japan. If you don't know, uh, there is a company called uh, Clean Planet. And if you look at their uh, website, these people are now pretending to, they are hiring people to commercialize uh, generators, heat generators. And these are heat generators, you know, developed by on the technology, on the process uh, made by uh, Ivamura, Yasuhiro Ivamura, with this uh, hydrogen uh, loading and deloading from uh, copper nickel uh, multilayers. So these people should deserve some attention, you know, maybe because uh, they come from the university, the Oku University in Sendai, Japan, and uh, they are progressing, progressively uh, developing new things. We know, at least, they published some papers in the past uh, showing that they do. Contrary to Rossi, you never knew what he, what he was doing. Uh, clean planet, we know what they do, or at least what they did. So uh, the interest could be now coming from Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, answer is, uh, it was answered. Okay, Nikolai Magnitsky, put your question, please. Um, my question is, um, uh, what do you think about the uh, existence uh, low energy nuclear reactions. Are they exist indeed or not? Thank you for the question. If you want my personal opinion, there is something happening for sure. We see a phenomena that cannot be explained by, uh, let's say, conventional physics and chemistry. Now, are we, are we, do we see uh, indeed nuclear reactions? Or do we see other type of uh, reactions, uh, not nuclear fusion, for example, but other things? It remains to be seen. In the Clean HME project, there are clearly uh, working on the hypothesis that, uh, yes, we have fusion, nuclear fusions of uh, deuterons and protons. But uh, with some other experiences, it is not that obvious, you know? So this is a good question. And, and yourself, are you convinced we have nuclear reactions or do we have other things? Thank you. What do you think, Nikolai? Okay, another uh, question of my, of my <laughs> I don't know. I, um, from my opinion, uh, there are no nuclear lower energy reactions. <laughs> there are another reactions, I think. This is the kind of reason why I love to talk to you in Russia, because you have different viewpoints, you know, points of view, and it's very interesting to discuss with people who have a different uh, point of view. Because <laughs> in Europe, we are all striving to find, to prove there are nuclear reactions. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe there are not. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nikolai, uh, for very, very interesting, very impor important. Uh, this question uh, was, was interesting for, for, for Jack, for Jack, uh, for, for Jack Ray. Okay, Klimov, put your question, please. Uh, Jack, uh, uh, thank you for very interesting presentation. 
uh, I have many questions for you, and I hope to uh, write uh, uh, these questions in detail in my message. But now I want to ask you, what do you think about critical parameter of your explosion? Water arc explosion? Or oh, there is an interruption. But I guess the question was about uh, water arc explosions. And uh, indeed, I don't know because uh, we make many, many discharges like this. And uh, you never know if the next one is going to be a small spark or an explosion. So what governs the explosion, you know? Uh, I notice that if we put, uh, in my case, I always use demineralized pure water. Okay. Maybe. While at uh, Louis de Broglie, they use an electrolyte uh, 0.5 uh, mole of uh, sodium hydroxide. Well, because after some times of operation, the water gets dirty. You don't see it's dirty, but uh, you, you see more and more small spark and less and less explosions. And after that, uh, after some minutes, you don't see explosions anymore. Just uh, and everybody see in your video uh, of the dirty uh, water with uh, some of the uh, nanoparticles of the er process of erosion of the electrodes. Of course. It's, of very, course. it's very important. Of course, of yes. course, and, and after some time. And, and also uh, uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, results connected with the repetition of the Urotskoy experiments. You, you told us about uh, um, uh, creation, additional creation of the deuterons. And uh, uh, and what's about another analysis for the isotopic an analysis of the titan titanium fo foil? Uh, do you remember that uh, Urotskoy uh, uh, gave us uh, 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 information about uh, chemical composition of the isotopic uh, composition of the titan? The titanium uh, foils. Uh, what do you have uh, the, the mass uh, spectroscopic analysis or maybe another analysis in this experiment? No, unfortunately not. You know, these experiments, again, they are made with very small, uh, let's say, laboratory capacities. They are made by small associations. Institut Louis de Boy, this is uh, very nice name, but indeed, this is a small association as we are. So they got the chance to make this uh, analysis of deuterium and oxygen 18 almost for free, but all the, only that. They, it would have been necessary to pay to have analysis of titanium and other chemical elements, and they could not pay for this analysis, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks for for questions. And uh, last question, uh, Dmitry Baranov, put your question. Dmitry, Dim, включи включи микрофон. А все, включил. Спасибо. Можно, да? Да. Давай. Жак, do you know that electrical discharge in water and electrical explosion in water. It's very dangerous um, for men. So um, there exists unusual radiation. It's and the experiment very dangerous. Uh, you know, uh, you know this. I know that because indeed uh, you, uh, Russian, told us this. You are the only one who studied these strange radiations, and we have to thank you for this. This is the reason why, indeed, during these experiments, I was never in the same room as the discharge system, okay? It was uh, working on its own automatically, 
but I was in the next room. <laughs> because you told me this well, is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And also, this is very important because these strange radiations, you know, each time I mentioned this uh, to my colleagues and uh, uh, they love more or less. I say, well, okay, but indeed, uh, some other researchers, especially in, Japan, in Russia, found strange radiation, so we should be very careful with that. And uh, it deserves much more, indeed, uh, investigations, for sure. So the only thing I know about these strange radiations are what you published yourself, mostly in Russia. Unfortunately, I, I have to admit. And if you have any paper on this uh, in French or English or even German, or, uh, would be very helpful for us, for me, because uh, I thank you for your advice, Dmitry. And uh, I remember the first time I heard about this strange radiation, this is Anatoly Klimov who told me about that. Since that time, I never forgot. And this is the reason why uh, I would like to know more about this. In our case, this uh, discharge are quite small, driven for a short time, a few minutes. And again, on a remote control. But uh, still, we would like to know more about this. Thank you for this advice. So if you have any piece of information regarding these uh, strange radiations, uh, we would appreciate it. Okay, okay, Jacques. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, for, Thank the, you. for the answer. And it was very, it was very important uh, question. And we, uh, Jacques, we sent you uh, our joint paper with Dmitry Baranov about consequences of uh, consequences of uh, uh, electrical discharge and influence on on uh, on living on living uh, on mouth and on 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 other on other on other living feature on uh, on uh, other living uh, 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 oh, for, forgot English words on on other living persons. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we send you. Uh, we will send you a paper. And Bob Grenier, last question, please. Switch on, switch on microphone, Bob. Bob, switch on, switch on. I, I, I got you, sorry, I, I was in a different window. I was actually trying to prepare something. Um, thank you very much, Jacques, for an excellent presentation. Um, particularly on the uh, water spark discharge, uh, I think Peter Grenot did a lot of work on that. Um, I shared a blog um, that I published a number of years back in the group chat, which you can go and see if you click on the um, chat uh, uh, button on, on Zoom. And it, it's the first there. And they um, created a, a water spark discharge by using um, a, an induction coil from a car and the diode hack, where you kind of like link, link one, one part of the coil to the top of a spark plug, and you get very, very intense discharges uh, on a repeated basis. And then on one of the videos on that blog, um, they had a, um, a water a, a, um, mist creator going through a tube with the spark plug, and they were able to continuously produce the large explosion state. Um, so you can see those videos, you can see how there's a number of um, art items on there. Thank also, you. in one of the videos that I shared on that about three years ago, um, someone noticed a, a, a cluster plasmoid forming away from the spark discharge that looks to be of a similar structure to that published by Bogdanovich um, in 2019, subsequently. Uh, where you have, he describes it as multiple toroidal uh, structures uh, in a crystal structure 
um, uh, that is able to spin on their own axis and on the cluster axis and travel uh, and translate or roll across surfaces. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested because what you've done is very similar in a way to Parkamov's woodpecker. And um, you were saying that you had a problem with uh, controlling uh, when you get a just a normal discharge and when you get a uh, this big flash. Well, um, if you look at the blog that I posted there, you can go and look at these videos, see how they've achieved it with simple equipment. And this should give you an ability at a very low cost to produce continuously the type of discharge that you and I would agree are the more anomalous type of discharges. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay. Right. So, so it's, it's just it's the first first link that I've given to everyone in the chat, and it also talks about the fact that I think it's MIT or Harvard the, the first discharge was observed I think in the 1910s in water, water uh, 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 like a water mist discharge. It's it's not a new phenomena, but uh, more recent um, work on YouTube has actually um, been able to perfect a continuous process of this production. Okay. So, okay. okay, thank you, thank you, Bob. Uh, thank and you. Bob, Bob mentioned about woodpecker uh, installation, uh, which uh, were used by uh, Alexander Parhomov, maybe, Sash, может быть, ты спросишь что-нибудь относительно эксперимента, аналогичный эксперимент, аналогичный эксперимент. У него дятел был. А это и вот Боб, Боб и назвал это вот Петер, дятел. Это то же самое. Так, окей. No, no, no reaction from Боб Пархомов. It means that uh, all questions uh, uh, finalized. And maybe somebody would like to. Give... Sorry, can I can I just ask one one more? Um, did he have equipment failure, monitoring equipment failure when the explosions happened? Because when I was, the second link that I put there, plasma flow discharge, the, the work that we did in India with Suthas Ralkar, he had a very, very powerful three phase supply. And when he had one of these blue fla flashes in this very large device, it ejected a large volume of water, but the entire three phase power supply shut down and we had to restart. And I caught that on multiple cameras. Did you have your power supply or whatever affected? Indeed, thank you for the question. In our case, the most, the largest discharge was just 10 joules, you know, 10 joules, so it's not very large. But indeed, it might very well be the reason why I didn't show these electrical uh, measurements, because we, we found strange electrical measurements. With three, with uh, seven kilovolts of, I use indeed five kilovolts of uh, power uh, input. Uh, we were measuring 30 kilovolts of uh, spike. Strange. So is vitriol or an artifact, you know? Uh, well, <laughs> so is that an answer, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'll be inter yes, interested course. in what the Institute find when they get some time to use the apparatus. Yes. Yes. Thank you. This charge, you know, it's a really a mess. Okay, and uh, I, I see, I see, Jacques. No, uh, no attempts to to uh, hand uh, hand uh, to raise hand to uh, to give uh, remarks. It means that no, <laughs> everything is. Is, is very understandable from your from your uh, presentation and everybody is um, well does, understood everything no no remarks please maybe you could give some final remarks yes yeah, so again uh, thank you again for this invitation as I said you know it's always interesting to to exchange with different groups you know who have different points of view, because uh, if we keep between ourselves, you know, we just repeat each other what we think uh, and we said uh, since uh, months or years, while uh, we might need to read different things to think 
at different uh, models, different uh, phenomena. And this is the reason why I guess it is interesting to discuss with you as the Russian group, because uh, you have different experiences, you know, different competences, and uh, all together, the collaboration could be very fruitful. This is what I would like to say. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Jack, I'm, I'm, I could mention that now in uh, your presentation, it was presented people from uh, Russia, from Kazakhstan, from Armenia, from uh, Ukraine, from uh, Alexander Nadezhin uh, waving his hand. He is, is in Israel now, but he is from Canada. And Bob Grindier from Czech Republic. You are from French, from France. And uh, it means that you are absolutely right that this is a way, such kind of webinar, this is way to uh, to join uh, to join brains of of uh, scientific from many many countries from, uh, around all, all over of the world. Thank thank you very much for COVID for COVID situation. <laughs> so thank you very much again for the invitation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bye. Friends, Bye. it means that we close our webinar. Thank you very much, and until the next uh, Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye.